Okay, great, 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 great. So, um, hey, thanks everybody for uh, having me. This is going to be kind of fun. Um, let me uh, just begin by saying, I don't know if I'll be able to convince anybody of anything, but, uh, you know, let's, let's see uh, if I can show something interesting. Uh, first of all, um, I hate the show. Actually, I just put this slide on here uh, just as clickbait for uh, gray hairs, uh, you know, so that I can uh, rank high on uh, Hacker News or something. Because to be honest, uh, the shell, after 30-something years of using it, it's kind of like a virus. It's inserted its, you know, a bit of its DNA into mine. So I can't really get rid of it totally. But I think we all have this... Uh, love-hate relationship with uh, the shell as Emaxians. You know, I mean, just think of all the terminal emulations we've got that runs in uh, uh, in Emacs. And by the way, if you still don't use a terminal emulation in Emacs, check out this uh, new V-term. It seems to work pretty well. But, you know, what do we use the shell for? Uh, just about everything that we use the shell for uh, we, we kind of have better options. I mean, you just saw that Maggot is far better than trying to do git commands on the on the command line and, you know, Dyard and all these other things, right? So uh, for this agenda, what I did is kind of thought about how we use the shell and how we can maybe use things a little better. And when it comes to the shell, uh, we kind of use it in two ways. Interactively, you know, command line kind of things and automated you know, writing shell scripts. And I kind of think we can improve both of them. So um, let's try some things. First, uh, I want to say that all the code and all this kind of stuff is a total work in project. Um, I'm not convinced that it uh, works as well as I would like it to be. Uh, that said, I think there's some interesting things here that maybe those who are willing to like look at source code and things would uh, might enjoy. So yes, tinkerers only. So let me start with a story. Um, not too long ago, somebody said, hey, can you restart OpenStack for me? Now, uh, this is my day to day job um, and uh, trying to maintain an OpenStack, a uh, lot of OpenStack clusters. OpenStack isn't a service as much as it's about, oh, I don't know, a dozen plus uh, Python apps that are all running that produce these uh, web interfaces and they're all cross-talking and this sort of thing. So just restarting OpenStack is not a straightforward thing. Yes, we have better solutions, but this was a, uh, a development box and somebody just asked me, hurry. So I just banged out this in the shell. And this is pretty easy, right? We all just do this. I mean, on one hand, part of this we could kind of, or at least those who have been using the shell for a while can just do somewhat, but I wouldn't say I got it right the first time, right? So um, the, the idea I want to concentrate on right now are those pipes. So pipes, I mean, they're like a, a, a lot like functions, but in the reverse order. But one thing like functions is they are very invisible. The data that flows through them, you can't see them. And unlike a, uh, uh, you know, most of our programs, we don't have a debugger running on. So what we end up doing is either running A, piping it to B, taking a look at the output of B, and then piping it to C, and then we kind of keep iterating it. If something like uh, A is a uh, time-consuming, intensive process to produce its uh, work, or if anything along the way is, it really becomes obnoxious. So one of the things that I think all of us do is just write it out to some file. And then we use some nice e editor to edit and change that data. And then we uh, use that file as the input to something else. And that's when I got thinking, it's like, wait a minute here. If I'm already using Emacs for editing that uh, stuff, why don't I do a little bit more? So I mean, the shell's real flexible, but Emacs, anything the shell can do, Emacs can do better. Uh, I'll, I'll state that. And so I was thinking that transforming those, that data, that flow uh, from executable to executable, hey, it's the same thing as calling one Emacs function to the next. Now, the second thing is once I've got that data converted, 
I need to send it or consume it to some other app. And that's usually a little bit more complicated. Like in my example earlier, I had a for loop and um, ended up running some command with each line in that uh, in the output from that pipe statement. And so I kind of made a list of all the ways that I, I do that. And I think this covers about 80% of what I use, maybe even 90, um, either as standard into some command or either using kind of like XArcs where each line is a, a argument parameter um, or something like uh, run a command on each line of the uh, of that standard in. Often though, I'm just copying it to the clipboard just so I can paste it into Slack or into you know a bug tracking system, that sort of stuff. And then often I'm just trying to look at it. Um, and so I wanted to try to address each one of these things in this. Now, so I wrote this little program called Piper, and I don't think I've explained it well enough, so I'm going to have to do a demonstration. And of course, most of my examples are work related. And that's probably not a good idea, just in case something shows up. So what I'm going to try doing is trying to get the status of an OpenStack cluster, but I'm going to use it on my own personal little system here at my house. And so I'm going to get the list of the OpenStack services and I'm going to filter them out and I'm going to uh, the, actually use it to get the status of each name. So that's, that's my goal. All right. So first of all, uh, I came up with, a, uh, yes, a program called Piper, a terrible name. And if anybody wants to help me come up with another one, that'd be grand. But I have three different interfaces to it. Uh, and it's basically, they're all calling the same code. Just each one of them is going to ask for uh, more information. So like uh, calling it this Piper locally here, you can see in the, um, in the message down at the bottom, just ask for a command. Uh, other directory, ask for that command plus a directory. And remotely, ask for both of those plus a host. So I'm going to go to a different host. Notice I've got a little history because that's going to be helpful. And, you know, I'm using Ivy right here so I can type in, you know, fuzzy texting to kind of uh, sub make subsections, right? Um, I pre-tested this, so I am going to just connect to the system. Uh, I've got a different history for the directories. And I cleaned up my uh, command history here. And I'm going to run this all. Okay, opening up the tramp connection, and here we go. I've got a list of all that stuff, and it just shoved it into a buffer, and now I can start to manipulate it. Now, the manipulation happens uh, with the series of functions that you see down here at the bottom in this Hydra. The red things, if you're not too familiar with Hydra, means any of those commands that I do will just... Um, will come back to the Hydra. And if I want to finish this up, the blue ones, um, so I can send it to stuff uh, that I talked about earlier that we could then, um, and, and it ends the Hydra. So what I'm going to do is you can kind of see the vertical bar, that's a pipe. So I'm just going to pipe this and now I've got my commands again. So I'm going to just pipe this to grep, open stack, here we go. And now it's, replace that buffer with the results of that pipe. So it's, you see, so you kind of think of it, I'm just dealing with this pipe, but I'm seeing the steps as I'm doing it. Let's do it again. Um, this time I'm going to pipe it to grep-v and I'm going to get rid of all of the dead services that aren't running. And now I've got it a little closer. Um, let's also try to pipe this to said, <laughs> and let's see if I can get this, um, this will be interesting service, splat, let's just see if I can get rid of everything. Okay, so now I've got a list of all of the services, and I basically just did that little subshell that you saw earlier. Okay, now what I want to do is pipe this, uh, well, not really pipe it, I'm going to call XRGs on each one of these lines and get the status of all of them and push them into a buffer. So I'll hit X this time, and in this case, I'm going to call this um, system control on status. And 
there we go. So now, um, let's go up to the top. You can kind of see that I've gone through each of those status uh, or each of those services that we're running and gotten the status of each one of them. All right, so that's kind of the idea that I'm trying to deal with. But what I want to show is that I don't need to pipe this out to shell. So let's close this and let's do it again. Remote, ding, ding, and all. Okay, let's get the stuff back. All right, so I have it. Now this time, instead of, like I say, calling grep, I'm gonna call Emacs functions. So I've made those, and those are kind of what you see in the last three columns. So I'm going to hit uh, the capital K here for keep lines. And I'm just going to be calling keep lines here and type open stack. And now I'm going to call this D, which is basically uh, flush lines. And I'm going to flush all of those dead guys. And now I'm just going to use uh, visual regular uh, replace. And I can then type in, you know, some regular expressions that I can then edit uh, in order to get it exactly what we want. And this is the power of Emacs, is I can do it more visually, even though I could undo a buffer if I did something wrong. I like this a little better. Same result, though. And now I'm going to call one of those blue guys and call my stat uh, status on each one of those. Okay, demo over. Let's keep moving on. So, the second way that we use um, uh, the shell is, is shell scripts. I mean, that's one of the real um, powers that the shell has is that you can extend it with these scripts. But that's the power of Emacs as well, is that we can extend it with functions. So somebody posted on Reddit a, a question about, can you... Uh, and posted it to the to the uh, Emacs subreddit about using Lisp as a go-to language. You know, I responded because lately I have been rewriting a lot of my scripts, and I've got 20 plus years of uh, shell scripts, and I have been rewriting them as Emacs functions just because it's so much easier. Instead of, I mean, yes, let's let's answer the question. Emacs is an operating system, and all those functions are just like little apps. And with a lot of the modern um, uh, functions, like uh, the Dash library that uh, Magnars has made, uh, the String library, uh, the F library, I mean, all of these things, as you pull them in, uh, including all the things from Common Lisp, you've got something that is actually really nice to use. And also keep in mind, Emacs is really hackable. I mean, all of the bad practices like global variables are actually kind of useful when it's your own world. Um, makes it very easy to, to make changes and you know you can deal with it and you're not gonna be publishing it around. But all the libraries are very helpful and, you know, the other thing that Emacs has, I think, over writing shell scripts is you've just got a better user interface. I mean, think about just the fact that you can bind any um, function to some key cord uh, is, is, can be very helpful, but also you've got all the a better completing read. You know, uh, tab completion in the shell is nice if you go through and try to get everything programmed uh, accordingly. But boy, you know, you can do it a lot easier with Ivy or Helm. And then if you think about, you know, how I was using Hydra or uh, Maggot's new uh, transient interface, which I'm thinking I might want to use, uh, you could really do a lot more with it than you can with the shell. Now, there are some good parts about the shell. Um, I mean, shell scripts in particular. I mean, they can be readable. Um, and they're very good at running programs and they're pretty good at data streams, but yeah, they may be readable, but they can also be unreadable. And uh, the fact that there are no types, or there is one type, string, everything's a string. So you're constantly trying to convert them back and forth, and hopefully you've converted them correctly. And uh, let's not talk about data structures. And this is, I mean, sure, Z shell is, uh, it's got some, you know, 
<laughs> you can now do arrays, but um, but you don't have the same sort of data structures that you have like in a real language. So my thinking is maybe I can kind of put the two together because, you know, Emacs list brings a lot to the table. Um, but what I'd like to do is maybe add um, variables in strings like the shell does. I mean, sure, most modern languages, uh, I don't know who really started it, but Ruby certainly made it popular. And also maybe I could use some um, short shorter names for a lot of the commands we use because a lot of because Emacs Lisp does not have uh, namespaces a lot of the na uh, function names become kind of long and unwieldy but once we've got that then we have you know data structures better iterations and variable scopings and you know just all these things that we can bring to the table so what, here is kind of what I wanted in my mind, and I've been kind of working on this off and on for a while. Um, I'm kind of ready to, to share it, but like I say, it's still a work in progress. But what I wanted was to have something where I could say, all right, let's make a script. And in that script, I can do this weirdness. And Lisp makes, you, makes that available because you have macro, so I can really convert the language into what I want. So what I wanted, and here are the five bullet points that I, I wanted. I wanted shells, uh, executables to just work, work the way we think they should if you are coming from a shell script background. I also wanted to deal with uh, pipes and data transformations and go back and forth, kind of like you saw when I was doing it interactively. I would like to do that when I'm writing scripts want wildcard expansion for file names and embedded strings. And then I'm, I'm still debating whether I want to rename a lot of, um, of functions to make them look a little bit more like a shell script. So shell script should just work. Um, I wanted to be able to just say shell and give it a string and have it work. Uh, I also wanted to deal with spaces a little better um, and, and make it look a little nicer for, you know, because like Otherwise, I'd have to have quotes within quotes. So in this case, if the command is just a command, like you see in the second example with ls, uh, then it honors all the spaces. And so all the options that go with it, um, uh, you know, they become parameters to ls. Uh, but in the first example, though, it would uh, it, it, it will split based on spaces. And then, uh, but I did want to have a little shortcut. So the dollar sign um, is just a, a shortcut for it because it kind of looks like a prompt. Now, uh, this would allow me to, uh, to pipe from one shell script to another. So you can kind of see that I've got this vertical bar going here. And this code works as you kind of think it would if you're just looking at it. I, I, dare say this is readable if you're coming from a shell script background. Now what's really going on under the hood though is I'm just using a temporary buffer. So the first command uh, creates a temporary buffer. Each command after that reads that temporary buffer and replaces it with its output. Now I can actually mix and match here between these shell commands and any Emacs function that can actually manipulate the buffer. So wildcard expansion, I wanted this little command program here to work. I wanted it to just magically work and it does with this macro. So what I'm doing here is looking through every string that is inside this Piper script macro and I'm just converting it. This may be good or bad, but so far it's worked out pretty well. If it doesn't find a match, it just leaves it alone and doesn't replace it. So seems to work pretty well. Um, embedded strings, um, I, yeah, I wanted environment variables and Emacs Lisp uh, or Emacs variables to both be um, workable. So I wanted like dollar sign home and dollar sign, um, like you can kind of see here, some var. Um, so this, this command here, this program works as well. So now let's talk about this shell-like commands. Like I say, we've got things like keep lines and keep lines, eh, in a way it's actually more readable than the word grep, but you know, grep is kind of what I'm used to. 
So I wasn't sure if I wanted to rename <laughs> the word uh, inside this Piper shell, uh, Piper script thing. I didn't want to, I wasn't sure if I wanted to rename keep lines to grip, but at the moment I'm kind of doing that. Um, also, I wanted to create things like sudo uh, to be, you know, basically change um, the default directory to a tramp thing, so that would work. And yeah, that works pretty well too. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, I'm going to show a, a shell script that I had once upon a time and then my new Piper script. So like, let's get the process information, the memory usage for both uh, Chrome and Firefox because I currently run both of them. Uh, Howard, can you please hold on one second? I lost your audio. I'm going to refresh one second. I'm using uh, the Rx macro for regular expressions, far more readable than just hacking <laughs> some of those, um, you know, incantations that we were, were kind of used to. Uh, but um, here I, I'm calling PS, uh, I'm calling my little keep lines function, you know, because it's uh, not calling out to the real grep, it's calling out to uh, keep lines and flush lines to go through the whole thing. And yeah. Here's a second example. Um, my uh, Linux laptop here uh, is, uh, has a problem in that every time I close the lid, it just turns back on. Um, found out that uh, you have to kind of take a look at um, a, a special proc. echo the device that you want back into that process and then that seems to solve the problem. So I wrote a script for that. Um, you can kind of see I'm just going through uh, a series of getting the list of, uh, of the devices, checking to see which ones are enabled, stripping them out so I could get the uh, device name itself, and then looping through and echoing it down in back into the process. Howard, sorry, can you hear me? So here's how I would write this. Um, first, I would uh, start it off with uh, sudo, so it'll change that. Um, excuse me. <coughs> so, uh, so first of all, it'll run it as root, uh, go through, grab all the values uh, from that process, calling grep again, in this case, keep lines. Uh, using regular expressions to replace everything. And then uh, I've got a special little for loop that will go through all the lines and uh, write that stuff in. Now, this is a little less shell scripty like uh, and a little bit more lispy, um, but still not too bad for converting uh, a shell script over. So the magic. Um, it's basically a, a, a macro that I've, uh, I've got written, and uh, it's pretty simple. I'm just going through each of the subforms inside of it, each of the elements in, that I pass into it, and converting them. And I am creating a temporary buffer to begin with, and then running through it. So the real magic, I guess, is in this transform. And this transform is a big cond. Um, and so I'm going through and looking for certain words and uh, transcribing them to call a different function instead, with the exception of the first one, whereas if I get a string, then I'm going to kind of take a look at it and see if there's any wildcard expansions or any variable uh, that need to be done. And if none of that works, then I just don't touch it. That's what that last uh, T element line does. So, 
to leave a little bit of room for questions and discussions, um, just in summary. The very first part where I'm interactively calling programs and converting it, I find that really useful and I use this all the time just because I would run some command, get a mess of, of data back. I can just manipulate it very quickly and then run commands based on that. Um, it's really good for that hacky, you know, quick stuff that I'm doing. Um, I do think that just about any Lisp is better than the Shell's language. And personally, I think all Lisps are better than all languages, but that's just me. Uh, Emacs Lisp in particular, though, is pretty hacky, but I think that's a pretty good thing for uh, the kind of use cases that, we, uh, that we're dealing with here. Uh, but since it, uh, you know, our Emacs um, REPL that we have running is this, uh, it's always open and it's always available. Uh, it's nice to have all these functions just at our fingertips and we can have so many of them to use. So I do think that um, trying to learn Lisp a little bit more will make it a lot better. Uh, as far as your your day-to-day -day lives. And if you want, um, check out that uh, Land a Lisp, and um, that's a pretty good introduction if, uh, if you're not uh, used to it. All right, so if you want to play, I've shoved all of this code, both the interactive part and that scripting part. I've put it on um, GitLab uh, you know, under a name, Emacs Piper, and I'm really sorry about the name. Like I say, if anybody wants to help me with that, that'd be great. Uh, and if you want to uh, play around, here are ways to contact me, and um, we can try seeing if there's something uh, good about this. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear us? Howard, can you hear us? Howard, can you hear us? Thanks for the presentation. We're going to solve some technical yeah, issues. I'm looking at questions to see if anybody's got something. Uh, do you have an approach for sharing the scripts made with Piper with other members of your team that don't use Emacs? Uh, no, this is uh, this is very much a personal thing. Um, since these scripts are running inside Emacs. Um, I do have some members of my team that use Emacs, but it's it's obviously not ubiquitous. And it's also, I mean, this is kind of hacky. This is for me personally. Um, we all have those personal scripts that we use, and this is what I'm talking about. If I'm doing this for work, for production, I do something totally different. And in this case, I have to use the tools that uh, my group and my company have uh, decided on. Oh, yes, I don't hear what people are saying. Um, Can you hear me now? Okay, while we, uh, while we ask Howard okay. to restart, um, well, to Hold at on, least restart his, uh, his juicy session, um, we can, what should we do? Shall we read out some of the questions? <laughs> Yeah, sure thing. I'm gonna do like refresh the page from my end as well to see if we can get the video back. Okay, so let me bring up that. Yes, uh, and then... Oh, if you, really? Yeah, but, uh, but you did a good job describing <laughs> I could, it. So I, could hear, I couldn't hear anybody for uh, so long. I just no, no, assumed no. it's all going we, well. We, we, kept, we kept hearing the audio. So you're cool with audio. You just you did a good job of describing everything. That's fantastic. If you would like to uh, to respond to questions, you can certainly go ahead and do that, do that. And if you so happen to refer back to some of your slides in the process of answering questions or do a demo in the process of answering questions, that is also totally cool. You have 17 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Um, let's see. If I... Also from my end, Howard's picture is frozen for some reason. Um, goody. 
<laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's just uh, restarting, so I mean, we'll be back soon. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Just uh, to make it nicer, uh, a little well, smoother. I am um, assuming you're going to upload your literate presentation, so I'm not terribly worried. You'll you'll get it up up there. Do you have lots oh, of good true, true. <laughs> Yes, true enough, true enough, yes. Uh, so here is the uh, the code <laughs> for the uh, PS. Um, yeah, you can kind of see the regular expression that's going on there. Uh, here is, here's the output from this thing about the, the laptop lid thing that I talked about. And this is the original script. You can kind of imagine it anyway. And this is my updated uh, Piper script that replaced it. And uh, here is the macro. This is pretty much the full macro. I've kind of expanded a little bit, but it's this is pretty much it. And this is the uh, transform element with this big long con statement. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. And there's this there's the summary with all the links on how to talk to me. And I'm sorry about my video being frozen. I think that might be something about uh, Jitsi sharing a screen as well. Possibly, or it could be that I think Sasha at some point got disconnected, or it might have been me. Um, I think it was Sasha, or maybe someone else. So, and that like Jitsi seems to have a problem with people joining or leaving during a presentation, and I just lost um, your video. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was probably me too. Okay. Uh, yeah, anyway, so questions. Yes. Okay, so uh, some of the questions. Um, you know, this, this little Piper project I've got, um, it, it's kind of in its own little box. Uh, there probably are a lot of um, options. Um, the, the SC shell, uh, I've never actually looked at it, but I bet it's got a lot. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have tried to rewrite the shell in different uh, languages like whether it's Scheme or even e uh, e -shell. Um I mean, that one is really just rewriting the shell in Emacs, and that's all the way in there. And that's a pretty good way of dealing with it. Um, when it comes to interactivity, um, this Emacs approach of right, uh, putting the data into a buffer and then manipulating it, that's a kind of a very Emacs focused approach. Um, but as far as rewriting in scripts, yeah, I, I, there are a lot of ways to write what we would call um, shell scripts in Emacs. Um, this is just one approach that I've been playing with just because I wanted it to look a lot like those shell scripts that I have. But yeah, there's a lot of better ways to write anything than it comes when it comes to a shell. I'm just kind of scrolling back here, looking for... Uh, oh, I'm seeing a comment about uh, quoting. Yeah, you know, that is a, a big trick when it comes to uh, shell scripts and, and, and spaces and quoting and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's really the biggest, I think, pain in, in the butt because you really can't use variables and treat them as such. Uh, since everything gets converted to a string and then gets converted back. Um, and I'll, I'll admit, uh, this little project of mine had the same kind of concerns. Um, and you can kind of look through the Git log and, and see just that. What, however, what I've uh, kind of fallen into seems to work pretty well if you understand that uh, once I have a series of strings in my shell, just to treat them as such, and that I can then jump back and forth between those shells uh, and shell commands and that textual output and the Emacs commands that I'm working with. 
because Emacs functions can just deal with uh, real Emacs. So it's kind of a, you know, going back and forth, jumping between the two. There are a few more questions in the Emacs questions. It's our Emacs Gone Questions channel. Yeah, I'm just looking through. <laughs> <laughs> There's one, um, how does Piper work for you in large files, like 10,000 lines or so? Oh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't gotten to that point. <laughs> um, you know, when it comes, when it comes to the first uh, case of loading all that into a buffer, uh, Emacs now has the ability to deal with huge buffers and it does it pretty well. Um, Granted, uh, like I, I've downloaded a lot of uh, Jenkins console logs, which can be huge, and go through and try to manipulate those. And once I um, trim it down, uh, it takes a little while to go through the whole thing, um, chunking it in into Emacs and removing all of it so I can get exactly what I'm looking for. But it works you know, surprisingly well, as well as I suppose, um, any editor could deal with when it comes to huge files. Uh, I suppose I could just bring it into uh, Emacs by but trimming it along the way. So uh, something like uh, the shell has been optimized for those long things. So it, it uh, the stream can kind of trim down stuff as it goes in. And so I might, uh, you know, when I'm pulling something into Emacs, um, trim that out. Uh, or trim it off when it comes in. That would make it a lot easier, though. OK, next question. Is the key to thinking about the workflow to convert stuff to buffer and operating on it? Yeah, that, that seems to be what works pretty well for me. Um, that's kind of the Emacs way, you know, uh, or, or at least the Emacs Lisp way. You know, uh, in Emacs Lisp, you've got these, you know, the primitives of strings and numbers and this sort of stuff. But one of the primitives pretty much is a buffer. And once you have a buffer, uh, it's like this very flexible, <laughs> very state-driven uh, um, data structure that you can put things in and out of. And much of the functions that we that have been written in Emacs uh, assume that kind of a buffer. We have a lot of uh, differences, like there's um, uh, regular repla uh, regular expressions replacing that, uh, that can work on either a string or a buffer, but almost everything deals with that buffer. So pulling things in that way and then going through and manipulating them uh, in a buffer seems to be the, seems to be the, the trick to what I'm doing. There's a question here about managing quoting when wrapping shell scripts in Elisp. Have you found some way of making quoting easier, like regular expressions, backslashes, double single quote characters, etc.? Um, so, so, uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So, using uh, the Rx macro, let me just go back. Um, like this. Using an Rx macro is a whole nicer way of dealing with regular expressions. That really helps with a lot of the backslashing that's inside those strings. Um, and it's just a lot more readable, a lot more maintainable. Yes, it takes up more screen estate. It's not as terse, but boy, it's a lot better. Um, once you're in a string that you're passing to the shell, though, with uh, with the spaces and all that kind of stuff, I don't know if I can, you know, that's really just the problem with the shell is just the way it works. So if you can, um, you know, call apps directly and give it the parameters that you want, uh, like you can kind of see on this first line to PS, um, you know, that that may help. Okay, actually, uh, um, Amin is having a hard time seeing your video again. So, but people will look at the the, the PS um, script later when when you upload it. There was a question oh, about sure. whether you've considered the closure threading macro syntax, uh, and kind of 
hard to describe, oh, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I, I personally use it a lot, and that's kind of the inspiration for a lot of this. Um, so each of the um, the little pipes. Let's let me go back to that example here. Oh, right there. Uh, Keeping in mind that is... we might not actually be sharing your video. But we'll see. <laughs> it's okay. No. It's okay. Describe it verbally. Let's see. Oh yeah, let's see. I can see let's your see video. Could... It's just, I, I mean, it's having a hard time. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't see Howard's screen. It's frozen on one of the slides. Okay, I'm refreshing it. Um, it keeps. <laughs> I'm really sorry. It just okay. uh, Jitsi oh, just no keeps uh, stopping it. All right, um, we can jump straight to something else you can you can handle out loud uh, yeah so I guess I guess so yeah, but yes it's... in answer to the question um, the threading macro is kind of how the uh, uh, the, the Piper script works kind of thing as uh, it just instead of using a uh, string or a list which is what the uh, closure ma uh, threading macro uses uh, this one just uses a buffer so it just is reusing that same buffer as it goes from thing to thing to thing Uh oh, did I lose everybody? No, no, I'm still here. Uh, so okay. uh, someone had a question. Is there an easy way of stepping backwards and forwards through the steps in a more complex Piper script? Or do you just break it up into small scripts? Okay, so in the Piper script, no, because it's just programmed. But in the very first thing, the interactive way, um, if I do anything wrong, I just hit the U and, and just undo it. And I can kind of like keep going back and forth uh, using the undo feature in Emacs. That's one of the things I think is really cool about it. Is there a way to interactively time travel as you're building your pipe? Like if you find out the command two or three commands ago, uh, so when you want to go back to and then build a new pipe from there, kind of like with T. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, uh, the undo tree feature could probably work, although I usually know it's broken already, and so I'm just backing up once <laughs> or twice. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose I oh, suppose this could get uh, wacky. I guess this is more of a you know you you you're writing the command the the right way, um, and you're processing it to get some data, but you also want to get some of the intermediate data and then process it a different way. Mm, mm. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, no, I had not thought about that, but that's a cool idea. Okay. Um, someone else has a suggestion. Would it be a bad idea to add elis primitive functions for reading files directly into strings and writing them back to files instead of into buffers? Um, I mean, as a, I mean it certainly could. I mean, that's definitely a, a shell approach is to just uh, write everything into into files. Um, I don't know if there'd be that much of an advantage with uh, the way Emacs has uh, has got it itself built because buffers seem to be that mode, that way of of uh, handling large things. So I don't know, but uh, you certainly could. I mean, that's the whole idea with a, a flexible language like Lisp, is that you can just you know try different things based on what seems to work at the time. Uh, and then there's a question, can the first example that used Piper be automatically converted into a Piper script? So for example, if you Piper hydrate the file and now you want to save the sequence of commands into a script, is that doable? Ooh. Or something like, like L macro, idea. right? That could be, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I like that idea. <laughs> I like that idea a lot. Uh, no, I hadn't thought of that one, but I do now. So yeah, that's uh, something. Uh, I, I like that idea. Like I say, this is this is a really a work in progress, and uh, so getting other people to uh, throw some ideas seems All right. uh, yeah. I'm and speaking of ideas, someone wants to make sure you've seen the closure rebel tool, um, rebel.cognitech.com. You can pick it up in the uh, questions channel if you want to explore. Oh. Okay, I will. All right. Any last questions for our two minutes and thirty eight seconds? <laughs> 
<laughs> or should we just let just so should we just let I mean uh, kind of refresh and try to see if everything can get sorted out for let's the see year? let's see let's see if I could let's do that I'll drop off then all right fantastic thank you so much